Kevin, how did your involvement in the Star Wars projects, did that provide any inspiration for you as you began working on the Dune series? Well, it's rather ironic that there's a lot in Star Wars that is clearly influenced by the original Dune in the first place, not just the, the desert planet, but the, the whole idea of uh, the Jedi Knights and the Force. And many of these have, have a resonance with, with Dune. I think the practice that I had in writing uh, likable characters and, and heroic figures and colorful alien worlds and exotic settings and cultures, I got a lot of practice when I was doing Star Wars. And it also taught me how to work and follow the rules in an established universe. Now, Frank Herbert left six books full of details that Brian and I had to follow to make sure that all the plot threads fit precisely with the rules that were laid down. So by working in all the Star Wars stuff where you need to know the colors of the buttons on the control panels, it, it kind of taught me how to do that. But a really good advantage that I didn't expect at all is I have I've sold millions of Star Wars books, and, and I have millions of the readers who do those. And a lot of those were people who had always wanted to read Dune, but sort of shied away, or they thought it was maybe too hard for them to read or too big of a book. But when they liked my Star Wars books and they saw that Brian and I were writing Dune prequels, they picked up House Atreides, or they pick up the Butler and Jihad and use that as as sort of a way to get up their momentum and start reading the original book. So that was a, a terrific and unanticipated advantage of bringing my Star Wars fans into the Dune universe. Tell us a little bit more about all of the plethora of material that Frank Herbert did leave for you. Yeah, um, there's there's a lot of material. Um, a, a lot of it were, was just conversations that I had with Dad, and I would know, for example, that a certain character might say certain things, such as, this is going to hurt me more, this is going to hurt you, or something like that. But, but beyond that, Kevin and I, in the notes in my attic, we found um, scenes, unpublished scenes, uh, that were cut from the Dune series. For example, the first meeting of Duke Leto and Lady Jessica, in which one of them holds a knife to the other's throat. I mean, who would think that that would that would be, work out? But but Kevin and I actually fit that scene into one of the novels, so that was gratifying. Uh, and also, we found a lot of Frank Herbert philosophy that's enabled us to use basically his words in many of the epigraphs or to use that as a, as a basis for our own epigraphs. And these are the little incisive remarks at the beginning of each chapter, which is so characteristic of Frank Herbert's novels. Also, Frank Herbert donated a lot of his papers into a, a university archive, and many of his drafts and many of his notes are still um, in storage. And we, Brian and I plan to go through all of these detailed um, notes and manuscripts to see what else we can find that might be of interest to Dune fans. And uh, we'll pull that together as a compendium, uh, like a scrapbook of interesting Dune material, whether it's um, chapters that Frank Herbert cut out of the original Dune novels or uh, the short stories that Brian and I are writing in the Dune universe. But I think that'll be an interesting companion volume and a, like a AAA guidebook for the Dune universe. Yeah, Kevin and I have made one trip into the archives, but there are, for example, the legendary editor John W. Campbell recommended to Frank Herbert that he move the ecological message in Dune into the background because an initial draft of the novel had uh, Liet Kynes, the planetary ecologist, was the leading character, not Paul Atreides. So John W. Campbell recommended that Dad move that in the background so that you're not preaching to the readers, you're not putting them to sleep. So we're looking for that chapter, those chapters, and uh, that whole storyline. Um, and we found, you know, alternate Dune storylines we've already found in, in my uh, uh, attic. So, I mean, there's, there's things out there that, that need to be put in something called The Road to Dune. You've both touched on this a bit, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about the process of writing. Writers are, are very creative, and these books in particular are, are so filled with imagination and fantasy. I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about the challenge of being in such a creative endeavor and yet having this framework, this legacy, the, um, all of the information that you want to be true to. Well, it's been said that ideas are a dime a dozen, and um, in the Dune universe, though, I don't think that's particularly true. I mean, um, it's just it's just incredible. Once we start thinking in terms of these various things, such as the planet X, Frank Herbert just referred to this this machine planet, um, an industrial planet, uh, the, the leading one in the universe, and so it was left to Kevin and me to, to flesh that out. 
that there's just, just so many things for us to extrapolate. Dad was, was great at taking a concept such as sand going over a highway in Florence, Oregon. Which Dad went down there to do a newspaper, freelance magazine article on it in 1958. It was called They Stopped the Moving Sands was his article concept. And it was just about sand going over a highway. But Dad took that and it was, it was he enlarged it. It's like the Sahara Desert has covered all these great cities. And Dad saw an entire planet that was covered with sand. And he had this uh, Messiah-type character like Lawrence Arabia leading the desert people on this great holy jihad. Um, so he was extrapolating off of things that are familiar to all of us. And that's what, you know, we talked about resonance. Well, um, we're always looking for these, these resonant chords, uh, and then we enlarge upon that. Um, and Dune is just full of so many uh, avenues that we can take. And the Dune universe itself is not exactly constraining. It's a huge place with thousands of planets and characters, and, mm -hmm. and it's like saying if you're setting a planet on, uh, if you're setting a story on the planet Earth, aren't, don't you feel too constrained? And, and all you do is you follow certain guidelines and boundaries, and then you set your story in it. And you, your story is filled with characters and conflicts and, and interesting settings. And, and boy, we haven't found anything that we've felt particularly limited in. And it's mm -hmm. uh, another way of saying it, it's almost like if, if you tell a chef that he has to cook with Italian cuisine, he doesn't say, I can't do anything creative because you're limiting me to Italian cuisine. Well, there's so much that you can do in that framework that um, we've, Dune has got, even just limited to the planet Dune itself, there are so many cultures and, and problems and sandstorms and giant worms and spice. I, there, I just get excited thinking about all, all these storylines when Brian and I get together to plot the books. It's usually just this exhausting experience because we're spouting ideas back and forth and jotting them down and trying to see who can kill whom and what, what can go wrong. And, and it's just a great challenge to put the story together. Well, as, as Kevin and I write the novels, we also have folders. Uh, I have probably 20 folders, and he has just as many. We have Paul of Dune. We have all these other books. And we'll say, well, that belongs in this other story. And so we just keep building on it. And it, it's an incredible uh, treasure chest of ideas. It's a, a great sandbox uh, for us to play in. Do either of you listen to audiobooks? Mm -hmm. We both do. Yeah, I, I listen to probably half the books I read are those because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm driving a lot or I love to play one while I'm, I'm cooking or, or working in the kitchen. And I've always got two or three going and um, I've always got two or three books that I'm reading, physical books that I'm reading too. And I enjoy them all. I don't, I don't like listening to talk radio or something because there's books that I can be reading at the same time. Well, the nice thing about audio books, and this is a plug for the whole industry, is that we waste so much time, uh, all of us do, but here, when, when you're at the gym, when I'm at the gym, I can put on my headset, or if I'm, if I'm driving you know, from point A to point B, I don't have to waste that time listening to talk radio or something. You know, I can listen to a great audio book. Are there particular genres of audio book that you like to listen to? Kevin and I both have very Catholic tastes uh, with a small C, very eclectic uh, westerns, and we, we like uh, war stories and science fiction and great classics, uh, you name it. Uh, well, and sometimes the, the humor um, and sometimes the thrillers and, and the, the books that I wouldn't necessarily sit down and read because I'm so busy trying to read the science fiction books and keep up with the genre, but I do my, my broader reading in audiobooks because it's easier to get... Um, Larry McMurtry's and Tony Hillerman's and John Le Carre's and, and those kind of books in audio that um, I love just listening to them because it's a different exposure to things. And I've, I like different readers and I pay attention to the, the ones that I like and the ones that I don't like. And sometimes the authors read them, sometimes famous actors read them. And it's just a, an entertaining experience all the way around. 